All looks good? good. Yep. Okay, great. So, yeah, so as Chelsea mentioned, I'm now going to spend a little bit of time summarising and going into a bit more detail about the different types of trash trapping technologies that are currently out there and in use around the world um, in the hope to kind of make a bit more sense of all the information that's out there, because there is a lot to look at and a lot to dig into. So trash traps, we call them trash traps, but they go by many other names as well. So they can get, often get called trash capture devices, capture technologies, trash reduction technologies, and so on. Uh, but they all work to do a very similar job, and that is to collect anthropogenic waste from our environments. So through the network, we noticed a need for one hub of information on all the devices that are out there. So we've developed uh, a document resource called the device directory, and uh, that is included in your resource package that we should have sent to you before the, the workshop and you'll receive it afterwards as well. And in this document, we've split the different devices into seven slash eight broad categories, which I'll go through today. And these include all that are on the screen right now. So that's stationary skimmers, booms and barriers, storm drain traps, automotives, vacuum devices, stormwater outflow traps, and skimmer vessels as well. So when thinking about what device might be the one, right one for you in your project, there are a few things to consider. And so first is the location. So where are you going to put it? Is your target location a river channel? Is it a coastal waters? Or is it within an urban stormwater system? And do you want this to be somewhere where people can access it easily or like Lakeman was mentioning somewhere that's maybe a little bit more out of the way. Second is your target pollutant. So often the goal, and I think this is the most general reason for getting a trash up, is to capture as much waste as you can uh, and there's no specificity about what you're capturing. You just want to get it out the water, which is absolutely fine. But sometimes groups might have a specific pollutant in mind. So for example, uh, they might have a harbour and there's a load of floating microplastics in the waters in the harbour. And so for those kind of situations where you want to target a specific pollutant that appears in a certain area, some devices are better than others at capturing the small stuff. So that's a consideration. Third consideration is cost. So obviously trash traps don't come for free. They cost a bit of money to either purchase or make yourself and maintain. And so the price tag can range from extremely low cost if you decide to do a DIY trap and make one yourself to they can be on the more expensive end for things such as vessels, skimmer vessels and trash wheels. Fourth consideration is maintenance. So how often does the trap need to be emptied or more specifically, how often do you want to empty it or how often can you empty it, depending on your people power. And so th often the difference in maintenance depends on the capacity of the device as well. So the capacity of the device and also how much trash you're collecting. So if you're in an area where you have a certain time of the year where there's really heavy rains, for example, like some of us might have been having recently, um, can, how often does your trap need to be emptied in those scenarios compared to the drier times of year? So it can change and it can differ um, and that's just something to factor into your decision making process. And finally, uh, or not finally, fifth is capacity. So some trash traps have collection points that can hold large amounts of waste. Uh, so these are great for situations where you want, as I mentioned before, maintenance is less frequent, but this does mean that there is a lot of waste to remove at one time. So this might require more than just keen volunteers with strong arms to come and collect the trash. You might need a crane or some kind of other infrastructure to help lift all of that debris out of the waterway or out of the trap. And so if this is not an option, there are also devices that have smaller catch bags, um, such as the, the Siemens, which I'll mention in a minute, that need emptying more often, but often this is a, a less than 10 minute job to empty the device, whereas for larger devices, it can be a couple of hours. So uh, this is also something to consider. And last but not least is visibility. So do you want your trap to be obvious in a really public area? Do you want it to be an attraction for the community and a focal point that you can use it for outreach and education? Or do you want it to blend into the environment and do its job in a less obvious way so that people know it's there, but they don't know exactly where it is? So this can differ depending on the design of the device. So some devices are really big and bright and can do the former and some are small and discreet and then they fit into the less obvious category as well. So we'll go through some of these 
uh, factors now for each type of device um, and just give some examples of how they differ between the different devices that are available. So first up are stationary skimmers. So we use an example of these, which are called sea bins along the Toronto Harbour front to collect debris. And these are essentially floating trash cans and they sit on the surface of the water and uh, they're often mounted to a dock. And so they collect floating trash on the water surface, including microplastics. We collect a lot of microplastics in these devices. So they range in cost from six to 12,000 USD. And that's because they're often, there's the size of a trash can um, and they need to be emptied daily. And so at the very uh, least weekly as well, depending on the environment and the type of trash and the amount of trash collected, sorry. Um, so the cost ranges depending on the, the size. So I mentioned some of the size of trash cans, some are a bit bigger, like the collector in the top left. Um, and but this can affect the visibility and the capacity. So obviously the larger device can hold more trash. Um, and the smaller devices can be more discreet. So they can be hidden in the in the harbour front if that's what you wish, but they can also be made more visible, as I mentioned earlier, by using, for example, the ITTM poster that we've developed, you can put nearby to draw attention to it, or you can make something like Inspector Seabin that we we mentioned uh, from Tobermory to make them a bit more visible and so people will look down and see them in the water. But obviously if you've got one like the Collector, which is big and red, it's drawing attention to itself already. So these are great and we really like these from our experience with them. Second is automotives uh, and I mentioned these second because they are kind of similar to the skimmers but they move around. So I like to think of them as little floating robots with mouths and they eat up all the floating trash. Um, I think that's particularly the case for the waste shark, as you can see on the, the bottom right photo, I think it looks like a little, a little mouth like a manta ray. Um, so these are often used in semi-confined waters and along coastlines because they have to be remotely controlled by the users. And so you need to be able to see them and watch where they're going and direct them towards all the trash. Um, because they are often remote control and says so like an extra technological part to them, they're often on the pricier side in terms of devices. Um, but they are great and so each time the device is used it, you can bring it back to shore and then it's emptied immediately um, and because they are quite cool little contraptions they have very high visibility so often when you're using them people will see you with a remote control or see you see something moving along, along the beach like the bee bot in the top right and often you'll get people coming up and asking you what you're doing and asking you about the device and how it works and so it's a really these are a really great way to engage people and use them as an opportunity for education about plastic pollution and the issues that you're experiencing locally. So next up we have stormwater drain traps. So these are positioned within urban uh, storm drains and they capture um, debris that's often washed into these drains during rainfall events. Um, so they often have either a grate or a catch basin that like you can see on the letter trap in the top left. Uh, with it that sits within the drain, it's kind of like a basket or a net that sits within the drain and this is cleared and emptied often on average about two to three times per year and because of their relatively simple design they're one of the cheaper options for trash traps um, because they are small and they're relatively simple. Because no storm drain is the same uh, the manufacturers of these devices have also designed them to be adjustable by size and shape depending on the basins. So this is great because it means that they can adjust it to what you need. And in terms of visibility, because they are often hidden in the ground, uh, they are low visibility traps. So we have recently installed some litter traps in Toronto and uh, we've added some little signs that can be put on the, the sidewalk to uh, allow people to identify where they are and can. Uh, look then take time to look into what they're doing and how they work if they wish so they can be low visibility but in the middle photo there it's called a that device is called a gutter bin and they obviously chose to have a bright green circle in the middle to make them look a little bit different from your average storm drain so again everything is adaptable there are options uh, if you want it to be high visibility or low visibility On the theme of stormwater, there are more industrial versions of storm drain traps that uh, I currently call stormwater, we currently call stormwater outflow traps, uh, but 
the some of the examples can be called litter socks and things like that. So they have lots of different names. These are often in line, uh, so within the pipes underground, or they're positioned at the end of the pipe in a stormwater system. And so these tend to capture a lot of trash, um, a large amount of trash. And because they get quite heavy, as you can probably tell from the picture on the bottom, those nets get really full, uh, full of quite a lot of debris. So it means removal is not just a, a take one person come and empty them. I think they often require a vacuum truck for debris removal or a crane to lift them out of the water. Um, and so this means that annual costs might be a bit greater for these because it, when you consider maintenance and payment for someone to come and remove the debris, that can add to the, the total annual costs for these devices. Because they are again hidden underground or often if they're at the end of the pipe, that's often in a location where not many people see it. So they have low visibility generally, um, but they can have a really big impact if you find that a lot of waste is entering the environment and your streams and rivers through these stormwater systems. Um, so they can be really, really effective. Next up, we are on to river traps. So we mentioned these earlier, these are booms and barriers, and they're really great for collecting floating debris along a river channel. Uh, so they can be low cost and low technology. And so these are a really great option for a DIY trap. If you just wanted to try something out, see what kind of things you're collecting, learn a bit more about how a trap might be effective in your local area. These are a really great place to start. Um, so they can be low cost because of that. And with their design, because they're essentially form a barrier to stop the passing trash, debris removal can, uh, depending on the design, can stop anything from small debris to larger items. And also the removal of the debris is flexible. And so this can be done regularly or less often, depending on how much litter you're collecting and how, and the, uh, the ability of that barrier to hold back that trash. So obviously if you're getting loads and loads of trash and the barrier is really strong, you could leave it to build up for a little while longer. If you've got something a little bit more on the smaller side, um, such as the the top right photo is called a water goat, um, something that's a little bit less industrial looking, you might need to empty it a bit more often and, and clear out that trash. But there are many different versions of these devices. Um, and as I just mentioned, some are much larger and more permanent looking like the blue barriers in the bottom right photo um, and others are more simple. So you can have, we've seen options of these that are DIY versions. So buoys with uh, netting around them that are uh, attached to the, the river banks, or you can also use, we've seen an example last week from uh, Tusco from the uh, Sustainable Seas Trust, they used bottles with netting to also try that. Uh, but there have been, it depends on, it really depends on your river channel and um, how the, the flow rate of the water and the kind of debris that's in there, whether the simple designs are effective or not. But they definitely can be in the right scenario. On a similar note, but with a bit more to them, we have barriers with a barriers and booms with a collection point. Uh, so these work the same as previously with the booms and barriers. However, these have a central collection point. So Lakeram mentioned this as the trap that we're hopefully they're hopefully going to have in uh, Georgetown in Guyana, the Bandalong Bandit, which is on the top left. So these have a central point for storage, which means that uh, the, the trash is collected in a really simple way so that you can collect it easily. It's all in one place rather than being spread across the channel. But because the collection point has a certain capacity, often these need to be emptied weekly is what a lot of the device manufacturers say. But again, it depends on how polluted the waterway is, on the size of the box, and also on whether you've had any heavy rains recently. Because as some of, uh, many of us know, and as Sarah mentioned right at the start, if you're having storms or heavy rain, then often the trash will then flow a lot heavier through that water channel. So it really does vary. But I think uh, with these specifically, there's a lot, there's a lot of very similar ones. And they often have different sizes and they're adjustable um, as with the other traps. So uh, there's always something out there that seems to, seems to fit most scenarios. Um, and because these tend, to, these are great devices, and as Lake had said, they look really great. So they they tend to get a lot of public attention, and you can really take advantage of this. So we'll hear about this again a bit later. But there's an example of 
a track called Mr. Trash Wheel on the bottom right, who lives in Baltimore Harbour, uh, who is a trash wheel, so a boom with a, a conveyor belt in the central area that collects trash. And they in Baltimore decided to put googly eyes on this track and it's given him a name and a personality and it makes people really engage with what's happening there. It's become real a real part of the community there. And so you can really take advantage of it, of this kind of thing with these devices and add googly eyes or branding or different colours, whatever you feel. Next, we are on to slightly more industrial types of traps. So these are called vacuum devices and they can be used on land and along coastlines and often work like a vacuum, or as I would say, a hoover, uh, sucking up litter within their path. So they're often controlled by a human. They take the nozzle and direct it towards all the trash. So that means you can really target certain items and avoid other things or areas where you don't want to be uh, disturbing but this means that they are limited by the size of the nozzle of the vacuum. So they can't pick up anything larger than that vacuum pipe. So they're mostly suited to kind of macro debris and smaller fragments and microplastics too. Um, but despite their large size, uh, they're actually not as pricey as some of the other devices and they have a lot of storage. They can collect a lot of trash with each use due to their, their larger storage bins. And so uh, similarly to, finally, similarly to, to the automotives that I spoke about earlier, these are, because these are man powered and they're large, they're highly visible and they are pretty interesting to look at. And so I expect that anyone using these will get a lot of spectators uh, watching and asking questions while they're, they're in use and becoming very interested in how they work and what they're doing. And finally, we have skimmer vessels. So these are essentially boats and they work on waterways to trap trash and bring it ashore. So they range in cost, which is to be expected, similarly to how boats and other vessels range in cost and their capacity is often as large as the boat hull. Um, so you can see in, in the photos on the screen that they've got a kind of mouth at the front of the, the vessel and that width is often how large the trash they can capture. So they can capture, probably capture fridges, as we mentioned, um, and other floating debris as well. Um, because of their large size, they are high visibility, but because they can also work offshore amongst other boats, they might not get noticed as much as other traps. But same with many of the others, you can add things to them. So uh, the example on the top left for Ocean, they had, have a blue vessel and they've branded it. So when it's moving around in the waterways and collecting debris, people know that's associated with their organization, they can assume from that what, what it's doing and why it's there. So again, very adaptable, but these are on the, the largest side of, of the devices available, I'd say. So that was uh, a lot of information, but as I mentioned at the start, we've written it all down uh, in our free resources. So we have our device directory, as I mentioned, which has got all the information about these devices, their cost, uh, where how to the websites to contact the manufacturers, where the distributors are located, if that information is available, and how they function. Um, and we've also got some other resources that we uh, have to help you along the process of planning and deciding what track might be best for you. Because this this part of the process is really important to ensure that you've got a successful project later on. So, in thinking about the location, Raphael mentioned this briefly earlier. We've developed a visual audit protocol where you can go into the field and assess your waterways and visually count and categorize the types of debris that you're seeing floating in your waterway in your target location. So if you've got three or so locations like Lake Crimpad, you can go and do a visual audit, which they have done, and compare between the locations. So you can decide on the type of trap from this. Say you're getting loads of large items like tires and things floating in the water, put, put in the waterways or ending up in there. And then you can adjust accordingly or if you're getting loads of bottles, floating bottles and things like that, then you can decide on a trap that might be most appropriate for that. And then to tie these things together, we've also developed a project checklist, which is essentially a sort of step by step guide for a successful project. All the way from these really initial first decisions about what trap you're going to use and where you're going to put it to thinking about how the device might be used and maintained in the long run. So what stakeholders should you involve? Uh, would you like to involve? Who will be maintaining the trap? Who will be purchasing the trap? Who will be doing the waste characterization and data collection? Uh, should you choose to do that? Who will be uh, working on 
sharing that information and educating the local the local public and community so these are all things to think about and it just serves as a really well we feel it serves as a, a great check step-by-step -step checklist to make sure that everything is considered at the start uh, so this should help your project be sustainable into the future so i think that's it for me um but i will stop sharing my screen thank you 